colloquium series. Our speaker today is Maurice Wilson. Maurice is a graduate student at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, currently applying for postdocs. He has a background in exoplanet uh, instrumentation and solar CME research. He worked on the Minerva Exoplanet Observatory to commission the spectrograph to develop software that remotely controls the autonomous robotic telescopes and to implement photometry and Doppler spectroscopy data pipelines to detect, detect exoplanets and characterize their physical properties. After completing this, he began using SOHO UVCS data and uh, plasma diagnostics to study the CME heating problem. And uh, as for as as for hobby, his fun um, is um, in his spare time uh, is that he likes to use front end and back end web development with JavaScript and Python uh, Django to create websites and mobile web applications. So. Um, Welcome, Maurice. And his title of talk is Constraining the CME Course Heating and Energy Budget. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I will add as well that um, the telescope software and data pipeline work, I don't use that for this particular project because I'm working on uh, archival data for this. But at some point, I'll get back to um, writing more software like that. Uh, for this project, I'm focused on constraining the CME core's heating and energy budget. This is a part of my final thesis work. I'm applying for postdocs now. And John Raymond is my thesis advisor. And for this project, all of our collaborators are listed here. So let's get into this. Uh, I'll start by giving a brief outline of everything that I'll discuss today. <clears throat> I'll start by describing the role the heating plays within the CME energy budget. Then I'll describe why there's actually unique characteristics within the SOHO UVCS observations made of this CME. The CME was observed in 1999. So there's, there's, a uni there's a unique aspect to this archival data. Then I'll discuss the spectroscopic techniques and the plasma diagnostics that we use the numerical calculations I made uh, for the physical conditions of the CME and describing how those uh, physical conditions evolve uh, through, as a function of height in the corona. Then lastly, I'll describe the final energy budget and heating rates that I determined for the CME. To start off, we can just think of it simply this way. Obtaining better measurements of the CME energy budget allows us to improve and get better physical models of the mechanisms that drive CMEs. We, in general, it's understood that after an eruption, there's a lot of free magnetic energy that gets converted into other forms of energy, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, thermal energy, so on and so forth. Heating is a significant portion of the energy budget, but unfortunately, a lot of the physical mechanism, mechanisms that drive that heating are not known. However, we know that heating is involved, even though we don't understand the physics of it. We understand this, well, one way we understand this is because the eruption of cool prominence material evolves uh, due to the extended heating that's occurring after the eruption. So there's this prominence material. We know that it's under uh, cool temperatures because it's seen in absorption features. And then later, that same prominence material is seen emitting a lot of radiation because it's at hotter temperatures now. Another example of how we understand that heating is involved or significant, significantly involved is because highly ionized plasma is seen at high altitudes in the corona. Uh, the idea is just that it wouldn't be able to reach such high ionization states without being continuously heated after the eruption. Uh, let's see. OK, sorry. There we go. The a lot of there have been like seven or 10. Oh, wow. Slides. There's been like seven or 10 papers that have quantitatively calculated the cumulative heating energy, which is just the 
total integrated uh, thermal energy being generated by the CME uh, even after it's erupted. So there's been a number of papers that have calculated this and found that it's comparable to the kinetic energy. And if it's comparable to kinetic energy, then it's obviously a significant part of the total energy budget. So the way that I started trying to better understand uh, this CME heating problem is with archival data of a particular CME observed on May 17, 1999. And I'll describe later why it's a unique data set. The data comes from EIT, LASCO, and UVCS. EIT and LASCO gave me great quality photometry on this CME. I hope you all didn't hear that. My Windows computer is, it's annoying. <laughs> Um, UVCS gave us spectra, a lot of great spectra. As you can see here with the UVCS image, um, the x-axis is wavelength, so you get the spectral information on that axis. And the y-axis is just position along the slit. It's, a, the, it's the ultraviolet coronagraph spectrometer. It's a single slit coronagraph spectrometer. So I'll be prime, most of my information comes from UVCS. <clears throat> Uh, here's the CME erupting in the, like the northwest limb. Uh, there's the leading edge. My mouse is over the leading. Well, now it is. Okay, there we go. Leading edge of the CME. And the, I put I made these blue lines just to show you where UV the single slit aperture was uh, positioned along the plane of sky uh, at different times. So as you can see, the UVCS slit captured the CME core. It didn't really capture the leading edge of the CME. So a UVCS captured a bright CME core. The spectral coverage is about 950 angstroms to 1350 angstroms. The slit aperture is programmed to observe at various position angles at, and at various altitudes, just automatically programmed. It can't predict when a CME is going to occur. It's primarily used to study the solar wind, actually. So we were lucky with this observation. Just lucky that it was programmed to observe or the slit aperture was positioned at this pos position angle, and it automatically just moves at higher heights along corona at different times. I do want to emphasize, though, that more coronagraph spectrometers are needed. There are a lot of coronagraphs. There are a lot of spectrometers. But there aren't many coronagraph spectrometers all in one especially in space. UVCS is no longer operational. So as far as I know, there literally isn't a uh, operating chronograph spectrometer in space right now. And I feel like we're missing out on a ton of information because of that. So I do want to emphasize that more chronograph spectrometers are needed. The information, well, some of the information that I gathered from EIT, well, the most important thing really was that I was able to constrain the plane of sky velocity of the CME. Uh, LASCO helped me out as well with constraining the plane of sky velocity. Uh, it also helped me, as you can see, confirm that the UVCS slit was observing the core of the CME. And some of the most important things that UVCS, the information that I got from UVCS, are all of these things. So I'll just go one by one explaining how powerful the ultraviolet coronagraph spectrometer has been. I'll first start by explaining that, <laughs> once again, uh, with this information, I'm able to constrain the plane of sky velocity even more. And I'm using this diagram to demonstrate how we acquired the plane of sky velocity with a single slit chronograph spectrometer alone. So if you imagine that this yellow circle is the sun and these white lines are the UVCS slit, and then these dots are just uh, just clumps of gas uh, within the CME core that we observe. And I plotted uh, velocity vectors along the plane of sky, <clears throat> just showing how if we observe some clumps of gas here and here, then we're able to, you know, different observation times, different heights, we're able to calculate the plane of sky velocity using this chronograph spectrometer. We're also able to get the line of sight velocity obviously because of the spectra, the Doppler shift information. So this is an example of the 1216 Lyman alpha line, neutral hydrogen Lyman alpha. Uh, you can see the C, a lot of CME 
it just clumps the material here. And you can see it kind of, it's like on the rest frame, the 1216 line. And then the CME is more Doppler shifted up here at this position angle. So that's just an example of how we're getting the line of sight information as well. Well, line of sight velocity. <clears throat> we're also getting uh, a lot of uh, spectral line intensities, which helps us better understand the ionization states that the CME is undergoing uh, throughout, throughout all of our data. So here are just three different panels of the CME, uh, sorry, the UVCS detector. So one panel, uh, I'm showing the spectral lines for the oxygen six doublet, 1032 angstroms, 1038 angstroms. Then there's neutral hydrogen, uh, Lyman alpha, 1216, Lyman beta. 1026. We even have a carbon-3 uh, emission, uh, and there's the CME emitting brightly in carbon-3. Now, one reason why with this was a unique data set was because with, with this single-slit chronograph spectrometer, we were able to accurately, uh, we were able to confirm that we captured the same clumps of gas from one height to another. It was pure luck, serendipitous, whatever you want to call it. So for example, when the UVCS slit was located at 2.6 solar radii, we captured this image, or the spectra. <clears throat> uh, this is in particular the 1032 uh, and 1038 uh, oxygen six doublet. Um, and then just automated automatic programmed uh, to observe the corona at 3.1 solar radii, we captured the same clumps of material. It's Overall, it's the same CME core, but literally the substructures within the CME core. This was, this was never done before with UVCS, so this was a unique opportunity, a unique data set to study, to study how the CME, the specific plasma within the CME is evolving from one height to another. So if we're getting density information, we get to see how that evolves. Let's see how the CME is expanding. It, temperature information, see if it's getting hotter, cooler from one height to another. We get to determine these things as a function of height. And you can sort of see here that we're also able to distinguish one clump of gas from another. So you can see like this sort of bulge right here. And it's sort of different based on our spatial resolution. It's like this bulge is different than that bulge. And then observing the same material, even though this is sort of elongated, it's also elongated over here. We're observing the same material. And then the bulge appears again right here and right here in both uh, both oxygen six doublet lines. So we're able, thanks to the spatial resolution, we're able to distinguish one clump from another along the slit, along the slit. Um, but over that, although that was useful to sort of see evidence, a little bit of evidence of helical motion as the different clumps sort of, we capture different images, we see the clumps change position and may even switch positions. There was a little evidence of helical motion, but it, it, what was actually more helpful for us was to just look at the, look at all of these clumps together as one composite clump of gas. And the reason why that was actually more helpful is because from one height to another, the CME might get fainter as it's going out further and further in the corona. So these small clumps of gas along the slit, uh, one might disappear, and then we won't be able to determine if the helical motion is continuing or not. So that was actually difficult. Uh, so it was actually more helpful to just look at the overall composite structure. So I'll be focusing on that for the rest of this talk, just describing all of the, all of the CME material along the slit. And with that, with those composite clumps of gas, uh, these are the light curves for it. So with the 1032 line, here's a light curve when the UVCS slit was monitoring the 2.6 solar radii. This is just the intensity and the X axis is just time, observation time. So when it was monitoring this uh, height, it took an image here, image here, image here, image here, image here. So just five images looking at the same height. So we're looking, we're watching the CME um, as the CME is passing by, just taking one image after another. <clears throat> and 
and we did it again at 3.1 solar radio. And you can see here that there's a similar pattern in these two light curves. There's a peak in the second to last image. That also gives us confidence that we observe the exact same composite uh, clumps of gas from one height to another because the it's just a sort of uh, the patterns. It gradually increases, peaks, and then goes back down. Gradually increases, peaks, goes back down. So we focused on the last three images or the last three uh, structures, uh, clumps of gas that we saw. And I called it clump A, clump B, clump C. Now for the 1032 line, clump B was the uh, brightest. It, it was brightest in 1032. But for different ions, they're going to behave differently. Neutral hydrogen behaves differently than oxygen 6. So it's natural they will get a different pattern. But nonetheless, consistency is important. So it was consistent. A gradual, the pattern is consistent. Gradual increase between A, B, and C. And then once again, at the 3.1 height, <clears throat> A, B, and C, gradual increase. So just regardless of what spectral line we're looking at, the light curves seem to indicate that we did capture the exact same composite clumps of gas uh, from one height to another, which is just so lucky. You can't predict CMEs, and you can't predict their velocity. So just it was just automatic programming for the uh, instrument. And we were lucky. <clears throat> now I'll describe how we constrain the physical properties of the CME using plasma diagnostics from intensity ratios. The overall concept is just that with these ions, there's this sort of balancing act between the collisional excitation of the ions versus the radiative excitation of the ions. <clears throat> All that, all that means basically is just that when you, um, these ions are being collided by free electrons, so they're getting excited through collisions, excite, then de-excitation, we get the radiation, versus radiative excitation where the uh, chromosphere, we're talking about ultraviolet here, where the ions in the chromosphere are emitting radiation as well. The radiation goes across the corona, hits the CME, the ions within the CME, and then those, uh, it gets excited, de-excited, scatters towards us, UVCS. So two different processes giving us the same photons. <clears throat> so with intensity ratios, this is what I mean. The oxygen 6, 1032, I already showed you the light curve for that, the intensity for that, uh, divided by the, uh, where's my mouse? Uh, divided by the 1038 line. And it usually hovers around 2.0. That's just... Uh, that's, that's not due to astrophysical information at all. That's just due to atomic physics. Uh, the oscillator strengths of these two transitions uh, within oxygen six, the oscillator strengths are just a factor of two different. So it's actually just atomic physics models that uh, describe why the intensity ratio usually hovers around 2.0. And here are our observations, uh, well, our observed intensity ratios. Uh, when the slit was located here, when the slit was located here, 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 at 2.6 solar radii, at 3.1 solar radii. Just to give you a sort of a back or understanding uh, of the concept, the oxygen 6 intensity ratio in particular is very helpful to determine the velocity of the CME. When the intensity ratio is substantially larger than 2.0, that indicates that the CME is moving very slowly. And that's because the radiative scattering component uh, of the emission is dominating. The radiative component of the 1032, well, sorry, uh, yeah, both, basically both. Um, 1032 and 1038, it's dominating uh, when compared to the collisional component. Now, when the, uh, like right here, this observed intensity ratio is smack dab on 2.0. That's when that happens, the oxygen six ratio is no longer useful. It's, it's too many degeneracies, too many, it's too typical. So you can't, it's ambiguous. The velocity and density are ambiguous and it's hard to determine 
the velocity and density. And that's because the collisional component is dominating. Collisional component at 1032, collisional component at 1038, both are dominating. Down here, we observed intensity ratios less than 2.0. And that's when there's a balancing act. That's when the radiative component is sort of similar or comparable to the uh, collisional component. <clears throat> and that's when you can constrain the velocity and density. You can constrain the velocity up here, but that's particularly when the CME is moving very slowly. But down here, when the ratio is low, regardless of the velocity, it can be a thousand kilometers per second. You can determine that using intensity ratios. And that's due to radiative pumping. And I'll just hop right into that, what that even means, why the radiative scattering component is being pumped. The intensity is sort of increasing. This is particularly happening for the 1038 line. So I already mentioned that ions from the chromosphere are emitting radiation. That radiation is resonating with the CME material resonating with it and then scattering towards us, UVCS. So now I'm showing you strictly just the resonant scattering component or the radiative scattering component, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this is just uh, showing you photons per second. And um, th these are just atomic models showing how as the material is moving away from the sun, the emission profile changes. So the color bar is just temperature. Uh, as the temperature gets hotter, the broadening, thermal broadening occurs. So the red stuff is broader. So don't focus on that. Just focus on the blue stuff, the 10 to the 5 Kelvin uh, emission profile, a uh, line profile. At the rest or laboratory frame, um, you get just your um, solar disk emission line profile, just emission line from the, the solar disk itself. But the CME is moving. Obviously, it has a velocity. So if the velocity is around 200 kilometers per second, there's this 1038 scattering component gets pumped up by a different, uh, by a different line. In particular, this is carbon-2. So there's carbon-2 in the chromosphere, and it's emitting 1030. This would be 1037, 1037 angstrom. Uh, line. But because from the perspective of the CME, it's moving. So that radiation experiences a, a redshift. And so it's the 1037 is redshifted to 1038. And so the oxygen six ions are resonating with that 1038 redshifted emission and then scatters it towards us. And so we're actually seeing, we're still seeing oxygen six scattered radiation, but it originated from carbon two ions in the chromosphere. So it gets pumped, uh, the observation we see, the, the radiation we see gets pumped here. And if the CME is moving at this velocity, it gets pumped again because a different line. There's 1036 angstrom line. More red shifted, gets pumped. Uh, I already mentioned that with the intensity ratio, we have the 1032 line in a numerator, 1038 line in a denominator. So when the denominator is being pumped up, the ratio gets bumped down. So around that 200 kilometers per second, it gets bumped down. The ratio gets bumped down. Around 400 kilometers per second, the ratio is bumped down. So this is an, ex and these are just atomic models, just demonstrating the concept. <clears throat> and I already mentioned that when the intensity ratio is substantially higher than 2.0, that implies that the velocity is going very, is very slow. So this is around 50 kilometers per second the intensity ratio gets higher than 2.0. So that's an example of how the oxygen six doublet when used as an intensity ratio can be very helpful in diagnosing what your velocity uh, of the CME is. Now let's see how this actually plays out in my observations. Plasma diagnostics from atomic models combined with multi-height chronograph spectrometry. So I already showed you this diagram in my velocity vectors uh, and I've already shown you this, uh, but I want to emphasize that the last two heights were 2.6 and 3.1 solar radii. And here, those clumps or whatever, they have intensity ratios here. What happened here was that 
at the higher heights, when we compare the multi-height calculation, just one height to another, one time from another, compare that to what the atomic models tell us, uh, you know, the oxygen six ratio, there's agreement. Here it's about 200 or 200, or it's about 200 or 250 kilometers per second, depending on what clump you're looking at, clump of gas you're looking at. And here, it's about 200 and 250 kilometers per second. But at the lower heights, my uh, calculations were different than what the atomic models were suggesting. At the height, at higher intensity ratios, it, it should be moving very slowly, about 50 kilometers per second. But my calculations were saying uh, 100 kilometers per second. So about a factor of two difference, that discrepancy. Uh, and we were thinking about this, why that might be in the most likely scenario or the most likely explanation of why there's a discrepancy at the lower heights and an agreement at the higher heights is because at the lower heights, we, we didn't actually detect the exact same clumps of gas from one height to another. So I'm showing these red dots, but what we concluded was that these red dots are not the same as these. So it just an example of we were unlucky. The UVCS slit took images and then shifted, took images. But as the CME was moving very slowly, about 50 kilometers per second, we got an image here when the CME is moving here. UVCS shifted, took images here, but the CME didn't reach it. The CME was moving too slowly. So we actually imaged a different part of the CME core, of the overall core of the CME. So that's where the discrepancy, uh, that's the most likely explanation for the discrepancy. It's a discrepancy because we didn't actually observe the exact same thing, which is why this higher heights uh, information was so lucky, so unique. Now, with these, as you can see, the oxygen six ratio is super helpful, confirming velocities. <clears throat> so we use these intensity ratios for other diagnostics. Some intensity ratios are velocity sensitive, like the oxygen six ratio. Some are density sensitive, some are temperature sensitive, some are sensitive to your ionization states of the plasma that uh, you're observing. We, on top of oxygen six, we use uh, Lyman alpha to Lyman beta. I already showed you, we have Lyman beta, we have Lyman alpha. We try to use oxygen five, which is a very, it's famous for being a, a great density diagnostic. There's a forbidden line and there's a intersystem line. And we, we couldn't use it because the, at higher heights, the uh, CME was just too faint with the forbidden line. It was too faint, we couldn't really detect it. So couldn't use the ratio. Nitrogen three, uh, it could, can be a useful density diagnostic as well. But both of these lines, 990 angstroms, 992, weren't, uh, they were too faint as well. So we couldn't use that as a helpful diagnostic. Uh, we, with other ratios, well, we tried to mix things up. We tried to compare, make as many ratios as we could. That was the goal, to get as many diagnostics as we can. And so what we did was we used oxygen 6, 1032 as a baseline for pretty much everything. Uh, we compared Lyman alpha to 1032, uh, Lyman beta to 1032, the 1218 intersystem line to 1032, the carbon three emission to 1032. And when you have different ions involved in the same intensity ratio, that allows you to be more sensitive to the ionization states. Uh, especially in this case, oxygen, same element, different uh, ion, different ionization state, oxygen five versus oxygen six. Once that ratio changes, that indicates, uh, that can be a helpful indication of the change in your ionization states. So that's how we're, those are the methods that we're using to constrain the physical properties. But we're, those are the, how we're using the observations to constrain the models. And now I'll describe how I've been modeling and monitoring the energy budget and heating rates of the particular CME that we observe. The goal is to calculate the post-eruption CME energy budget. 
we understand that there's a fraction of magnetic energy that gets converted into all these other forms of energy. And, you know, there's still some magnetic energy remaining in the flux world. But unfortunately, we didn't observe, uh, based on the, all of the different observations we could find on the CME, there were no, observ no measurements of the magnetic field. So we don't really have magnetic energy estimates. But we do have kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and thermal energy. With the thermal energy, uh, we try to, in our modeling, uh, we try to, well, just numerical modeling, we try to account for that th thermal energy based on how there's radiative cooling within the CME, there's expansion cooling. With the heating mechanisms, like I said earlier, it's not well understood, the, the physical mechanisms that drive the CME heating problem. But we at least try to account for some form of heating within the CME. So in my CME heating numerical calculations, I monitor the internal energy of the CME system. I do that by just accounting for how the energy and characteristics of the, of the plasma evolve. Uh, the heating is changing over as a function of height. Um, the expansion cooling, the radiative cooling, the temperature obviously is changing if there's cooling and heating. The density is changing. There's expansion of the CME. And we also respect that there are changes in the ionization state. And we try to account for that with non-equilibrium ionization calculations. Uh, the ionization equilibrium assumption uh, in general is not very great, uh, not a great assumption for CMEs. Um, so we use non-equilibrium ionization calculations. In our procedure, um, uh, we start by assuming, uh, trying out three different self-similar expansion rates. So we just assume that the CME is self-similarly expanding at a rate that is proportional to some power law. So the density is changing with time, where the power law index is three, two, or one, just sort of representing the dimensionality of the expansion with a uh, cubic or quadratic or linear uh, power law. So we try different things. The even though we don't understand the physical mechanisms of the heating, we still try to determine what parameters are most important for that heating process. Uh, so we just have a heating term that's proportional to density. Uh, the heating can be proportional to uh, the square of the density. And the more physically motivated parameterizations that we have are um, is one based on wave heating models of the solar wind, actually. Uh, so with that one, uh, the parameterization is just uh, the heating decays exponentially. There's a there are magnetic uh, heating models where um, we try to sort of account for that, just parameterizing it as a change in magnetic pressure. So as the flux rope of the CME is expanding, the magnetic pressure is changing, and that can affect the heating of the CME. So we try to account for that. And the three and two just once again represents sort of dimensionality, three dimensional versus two dimensional expansion. And then we actually start the model uh, with three initial conditions. We have a grid of models and each cell starts off with three, these three conditions. We have a heating rate coefficient. Uh, the heating changes, but there's a heat coefficient within that uh, parameterization. We start off with an initial temperature and an initial density, and we allow the temperature and density to evolve uh, over time. We allow a variety of things to evolve, but these are the most important things. So here's an example of one of my results for how we've constrained the physical properties of the CME and the evolution of the CME. This is just one of many results, so I, I don't, I can't show you every plot. But basically, what you're about to see is the temperature profiles, so y-axis temperature, and over here, density. So the temperature profiles, have temp temperature and density are evolving uh, based on self-similar expansion rates. So I already mentioned that we tried three different expansion rates, cubic, quadratic, and linear. I'm not showing the cubic one because there was, uh, it didn't agree. No models using a cubic uh, expansion rate agreed with our observations. So I don't have results on that because it just didn't work out. Um, and that's, it's basically, we find that something closer 
to a quadratic self-similar expansion rate is best um, in this very sort of simplified 1D uh, numerical modeling. So here are the initial conditions of the final models. Um, the temperature starts at 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 6, or for this assumption, for this power law, the models start at 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 5. Wait, what's that? Yeah, 10 to the 5. And I'll just let it go. So the temperature is evolving. The density is evolving. The density is simple because it's just evolving based on this power law. So that's it's simple. But it's constrained based on this intensity ratio. So we're back to intensity ratios. In this case, I am showing you results from the Lyman alpha to 1032 line intensity ratio. Based on the observed intensity ratio, we're calculating an intensity ratio in our models. And for each of these models or profiles, they have to be in agreement with the observed intensity ratio. So based on those observations, we're constraining it here at 2.6 solar radii. That's where one of our, you know, the slit was at that 2.6 solar radii. And the slit was also at 3.1 solar radii. So that's where our constraints are. And we've constrained the density to, well, whatever this is, 10 to the 6, about, about 10 to the 6. And under this assumption, these models are constrained to about 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 6. And over here, the upper limit in temperature versus the lower limit in temperature, so on and so forth, depending on the assumptions made with our power law and other assumptions. <clears throat> so this is just an example of showing you how, what kind of profiles we're getting and uh, how we're constraining the temperature. So the temperature, once again, I'm showing you the exact same results, but now I'm showing you how the ionization states can change, how, well, in particular, the ionization fraction. So we're using the observed neutral hydrogen Lyman alpha and oxygen 6, 1032, that intensity ratio to constrain our models. So to constrain the ionization states, I need to account for the neutral hydrogen and oxygen 6 ions. Remember, A, B, and C represent the three clumps that uh, I discussed at the near the beginning of the talk. Clump A, clump B, clump C, and that light curve. So we're constraining it per clump, per, yeah, per clump, per model, so on and so forth. You can see here, this is the exact same plot as last time. But over here, the ionization states, well, the ionization fraction is changing. The square is the neutral hydrogen. So here are the squares right here. Neutral hydrogen starts at this ionization fraction. And the diamonds are oxygen six. Oxygen six ions start around here. And as you can see, they sort of plateau right here for particularly oxygen six. That's an example of it reaching its freeze-in height. It's frozen in about here. Its ionization state is frozen in about here or something. And then it just stays there. So that's an example of how we're sort of uh, determining the freezing height as well and how the ionization states are changing or staying the same as a function of height in the corona. So that was pretty much everything with the physical properties, the physical conditions that are evolving over as a function of height. We're constraining that, but after constraining that, that allows us to constrain our overall energy budget, which is part of the goal of this project. Um, so now I'm showing you the kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. So the y-axis is velocity, and that directly corresponds to a kinetic energy. The x-axis is just uh, where the slit was capturing observations at 2.6 solar radii, 3.1 solar radii. <clears throat> and these models in particular are for this power law. Uh, I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. We have a lot of different examples and models and results. So this is a very simplified plot. <clears throat> and in this case, instead of using just one intensity ratio to constrain our models, we use two simultaneously. So I already mentioned oxygen six is a great diagnostic, it can be used as a great diagnostic for your velocity. And as you can see, these error bars are super constrained because of the oxygen six ratio constraints and simultaneously because of the other ratio. 1216 to 1032 uh, intensity ratio. So, but this is just one example. Um, 
So this is saying that at 2.6, the clump, particularly clump B, is uh, found to be about 220 kilometers per second. And clump B, when observed at 3.1 solar radii, radii is about the same, 220, 215, pretty much about the same within some statistical noise. Um, <clears throat> so the height is directly proportional to the gravitational potential energy. So I'm just showing that from velocity to kinetic energy, the kinetic energy here is about 10 to the 14 ergs per gram, the specific energy uh, ergs per gram. So just keep that in mind. For our CME, it's about 200 kilometers per second correlates with that 10 to the 14 ergs per gram. Consider the velocity diagnostics, consider the ionization states, consider, I call this a multi-ion ratio just because, you know, we're using two different ions in the same ratio, neutral hydrogen and oxygen six. So when you're constraining your energy budget, be careful with the, the implicit assumptions that are made when using this technique. What I'm assuming by using this is that neutral hydrogen is experiencing the exact same conditions as the oxygen six ions. Temperature is the exact same. The velocity is the exact same. Neutral hydrogen is moving at the exact same speed as oxygen six. They have the exact same density as a function of height. All of these things are the exact same. At, at least that's the assumption. And with that assumption, I'm showing you results that were in agreement with the data. So it's a fair assumption, but there weren't, uh, to be frank, there weren't uh, too many models. Uh, there weren't many models that agreed with it, but there were some. Um, but just be mindful of those assumptions. Finally, uh, with this plot, I'm just going to simply show how we're including the heating, the cumulative heating energy. So just that uh, thermal energy continuously generated within the CME as a function of height. <clears throat> well, total, the total heating energy um, being compared to the kinetic and gravitational energy just to show whether or not the heating energy is significant or not. So what you're seeing here, once again, just models under the assumption of the, uh, these two power laws. I didn't show the third power law. I think I mentioned that earlier, the cubic one, because the no models were in agreement with the data. And the reason for that, I didn't say this, uh, the heating was just, the heating rates were just too fast. The, the, the model CME was just getting heated way too fast with a very fast expansion rate uh, or power law. <clears throat> so here, with these models for clump A, B, and C, clump, uh, where is it? Clump A, clump B, clump C. Uh, it's about 10 to the 14. And here under this slower expansion rate, the heating rates or the heating total heating energy is about 10 to the 14, 10 to the negative one, so 10 to the 13. Uh, so previously I just showed you that the, our results are suggesting 200, about 200 kilometers per second, 10 to the 14 Earths per gram for kinetic energy. So this is showing you how, uh, well, this is about 10 to the 15 total, but the kinetic energy is about 10 to the 14. So it's about the same, even my results. So I'm writing a paper now where I'm gonna, uh, my results are in agreement with a lot of other people's, well, about seven or 10 other papers where they also find the cumulative heating energy is comparable to the kinetic energy and the gravitational potential energy. So this is just showing the models being constrained by the observations at 2.6 solar radii with a slit. These are the models being constrained at 3.1 solar radii. The reason why it shifted like that is because of the gravitational potential energy, you know, from one height to another, the gravity, gravitational potential energy changes. Um, <clears throat> so just the overall picture is this. Um, here are the models constrained by these observations, and then the second observations uh, at the other height. So that just gives you the overall picture being constrained by this intensity ratio in particular. Finally, <clears throat> uh, I'll just summarize everything that we've discussed today. I've been trying to constrain the CME core's heating and energy budget. In general, it is difficult to measure the magnetic energy Unfortunately, there were no observations for this particular CME that did that. But we do have a robust approach for precisely determining 
the kinetic energy, gravitational energy, the thermal energy, and the cumulative heating energy. We inferred initial conditions of the CME <clears throat> based on the constraints made from observations. And those observations were taken with a single slit coronagraph spectrometer at two different heights uh, in the plane of sky, <clears throat> which was very lucky. My results uh, are suggesting that cumulative heating energy are about the same as the kinetic energy. But when you include the gravitational potential energy, remember, my CME is about 200 kilometers per second. That's very slow. Well, to be specific, the CME core was 200, about 200 or 250 kilometers per second. The leading edge was actually 500 uh, at those same heights. The leading edge was about twice as much. But in general, even if you include the gravitational potential energy, it's still about 10%. The cumulative heating energy is about 10%. <clears throat> uh, I guess I should say as well, other people, I mentioned seven or 10 other papers. There's like Murphy, 2011, Akmal, 2001, Landy, 2010, so on and so forth. Lastly, I want to emphasize more coronagraph spectrometers like UVCS are needed. UVCS is no longer operational. Uh, so I don't think there are any chronograph spectrometers all in one in space right now. But I do want to add that it should, the next edition of chronograph spectrometers should have multiple slits. And the reason why is because of what I've been saying repeatedly throughout this talk. I was lucky with this archival data set. Uh, this has never been done before with chronograph spectrometers because all chronograph spectrometers as far have had single slits and they weren't lucky enough to capture a CME, the exact same clumps of gas twice at different heights. But soon UV, UVSC Pathfinder <clears throat> will be launched. That'll be launched on November 22nd um, <clears throat> in space. Uh, it'll, it's a chronograph spectrometer with two slits. And I plan on working on that uh, for uh, during my postdoc years. I plan on working on that when that data goes live. Lockyer is, uh, is currently being designed as a chronograph spectrometer with, I think, five slits. So that would be wonderful for me, you know, studying CMEs and just having five slits monitor the corona and just, just staying still, no movement or anything like that, just staying still as a CME just gradually goes by and I get to constrain the physical properties as a function of height in the corona. So that's all I'll leave you with. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed this talk and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Marish. And uh, now it is open for questions. Please, um, Jeffrey. Yeah, uh, I have a question. Namely, um, you haven't mentioned uh, the mass of the CME. And a uh, big question is, what's the relationship between mass and kinetic energy in CMEs? So do you have, can you make any statement about that? Yeah, in general, it's about, we're using LASCO. Um, I estimated about 10 to the 14 grams, but I didn't even, I didn't even need to uh, include that actually in my, because um, actually all I've done with the specific energy, I wanted to use the specific energy just to account for any uncertainties in the mass and any uncertainties in different, in people's different ways of calculating the mass. So to avoid dealing with those uncertainties, I just calculated just one half V squared instead of one half MV squared. So that's how I got the specific energy, specific kinetic energy. Um, uh, so yeah, if you want a mass estimate, it's about 10 to the 14 grams, but I try to stay away from that so that I can directly compare my energy budget results to other people's energy budget results which were also in terms of specific energy hertz per gram. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Yes. Paul. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm interested in um, how the fact that you only really image in plane of the sky affects your assumptions about various things. I can see it impacting the your estimate of the gravitational energy, for instance, and maybe also the 
resonance scattering um, from the from the photosphere. You don't know exactly how far from the photosphere you really are. And um, I was wondering how, how much of an effect do you think that might have? Yeah, uh, in some cases, based on the way we perform this technique, well, it was because of the, so I'll explain in different ways. With the observations, uh, with the line of sight velocity, it was very low compared, it was about 50 uh, kilometers per second in the line of sight compared to 250 for the plane of sky. And so that's, it's it's almost negligible. Um, well, that's about, a, that's about a 10 degree or 20 degree um, off the plane. Did you determine that line of sight just from Doppler shift of the line? Yeah, just from Doppler shift, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it, it, so, okay, that's one way to, sort of relieve uh, the uncertainties, just to confirm that the uh, line of sight component, the velocity wasn't, was basically negligible. Another thing I'll say though, is that uh, we did notice um, in the final models, you, you know how I was using intensity ratios, a bunch of different intensity ratio with different ions. We noticed definitely evidence that some, for example, the temperature, we noticed that the temperature for certain intensity ratios or for certain ions was very different than the temperature of other ions, which gave us the hint that, oh, we're looking at different material along the line of sight, like the oxygen six ions may be foreground or background, whatever, we don't know. It, oxygen six may be foreground while the neutral hydrogen is background. We, we don't know which one is which, but um, we did notice that based on temperature, based on density, Another way we noticed that was particularly with carbon three. Carbon three was the problem child. It was bright, so we were able to really get good data on it. But when it came to modeling, remember I briefly mentioned that we compare carbon three 977 emission to 1032, the oxygen six, that we use that ratio. When you're using that ratio, the assumption is that carbon three has the exact same temperature as oxygen six exact same density, exact same velocity. That proved very futile uh, in a lot of ways. And that gave us the hint that carbon three is definitely in a different part of the CME, oh, different uh, part of the line of sight than oxygen six. So it was carbon three in particular that gave us the most discrepancy in that regard. Are your, um, are the, the UVCS slip positions um, frequent enough in space that you can try and maybe compare the velocity from your ratio method with just tracking a feature as it moves out? Because that might be one way to kind of compare, kind of uh, see how how true it is, like the plane of the sky. See, see how kind of yeah yeah. So great question. We um, we so as a so. To capture the exact same material, that was the tricky part. Yeah, we captured the core at a bunch of different heights, the overall CME core. But as a function of height, it wouldn't work if you don't have the exact same material. And we did that only for two heights, and but that was great still with two heights separated by half a solar radius, so solar radius, two point six to three point one. That was beautiful. Um, we were able to constrain the initial conditions of the CME to a certain extent as well. There are uncertainties, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, we tried exactly what you just said, but um, we there were discrepancies, and particularly in the velocity, there were discrepancies, uh, that factor of two difference, that 50 kilometers per second versus 100. And there was just the image itself, looking at the clumps of gas along the slit. As they move, maybe due to helical motion, something like that, as they move, it, some disappear, some go behind each other. So it's like here, and then they connect and then go. Down. So when they're neck on top of each other, we it's just like crap. They're uh, different. We don't know the line of sight information. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So, um, I have a question uh, just from curiosity. Um, your uh, May, May 17, 1999, 
Mm -hmm. CME. Uh, was that associated with any clear or it just pro produced only CME? Uh, it was, so with EIT, EIT was the only instrument that I could find that actually uh, captured this CME upon eruption. And based on the EIT image, I stared at those images like crazy and I couldn't, I couldn't see a flare um, through those images alone. So EIT has uh, 195 angstroms. It was like 270 something as well, at 301 angstroms as well. Um, and I think the reason why, based on me studying the images, I think I'm pretty confident that the flare, if there was a flare, it happened behind, slightly behind the limb of the sun because, well, it, it, you'd have to look at the images, but there was like a dark region and there was no flash and then the CME erupts and it looks like the CME uh, uh, strands of just plumes of gas seem to extend down to the surface of the sun, but behind the limb. So it was like pretty, it was pretty obvious that it was that the eruption occurs slightly behind the limb. And so I, I think that's why I didn't see any flare. But I wish there were more instruments to capture this particular CME. I, I wish that was the case. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, if not, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. It's been lovely giving a talk. Uh, please feel free to contact me for anything and every reason. Any questions or any concerns, any ideas, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>